The Peter Schiff Show. What a difference two days make. Two days ago, I recorded my podcast, Goldman Sachs, Sachs Gold. And that was because I think Goldman's comments about shorting gold, right? Not just selling it or not buying it, but actually selling it short, I think were partially responsible for the severity of that drop over the holiday weekend, which sent gold down about 50 bucks. Gold stocks, I mentioned the XAU was down about 8.5% on a 3% down move in the price of gold. Well, today, gold is fighting back. At one point, I saw gold up better than $30, although as I'm recording it now after the close of the U.S. stock market, the price of gold has pulled back a bit. It's still above $1,230, up about $22 on the day. Gold stocks, the GDX index, I mentioned it in the previous podcast, It was up just over 6% on the day. This is the biggest move up of the year. This is even bigger than the move up last Thursday when gold was up by 4%. Here we're up 6% on a move in gold of just over 2%. And between yesterday and today, that index has recovered everything it lost on, on Tuesday. And in fact, it would be at a higher level if it weren't for Newmont. I mean, Newmont came out with worse than expected earnings for the fourth quarter. And so Newmont stock was only up about 1%. Now I say only 1%, I mean, it was down 7% within the first hour of trading as a result of those earnings. And it spent the entire day crawling out of that hole. But had it not reported worse than expected earnings, the GDX probably would have been up a lot more than 6%. And it would be at a new high for the year. In fact, Several gold stocks that I follow and that I own made new 52-week highs today, and several others that didn't quite make new 52-week highs are still at their highest point of this calendar year. So a very, very strong day for gold and gold mining stocks coming just a couple of days after Goldman Sachs recommended selling the metal short. As I said, it would have been people would have been much better off just shorting Goldman Sachs because by gold, while gold was up better than 2% today, Goldman Sachs went the other way, falling by better than 2% in price. Now, one of the many catalysts for today's rise in the price of gold may well have been the comments overnight by Jim Bullard. And, you know, after I heard or read about these comments, I actually expected the price of gold to rally right away. And I was rather surprised uh, that the rally didn't begin until earlier this morning. It really should have begun last night because Bullard was one of the real hawks on the Fed. And of course, you know, the bar is really low for being a hawk these days. But Bullard was one of the guys saying that we should have moved earlier. He wanted to raise rates earlier. He was concerned about a stock market bubble, right? He said that we don't want to keep rates, you know, too low because we don't want to create a bubble in the stock market. Of course, when he said that, I was like, you know, it's a little bit too late for that, right? Talk, Talk about closing the barn door after the horses have left. I mean, they've left the barn, they've left the stables, they've left the property. I mean, they're barely even on the planet. I mean, this you know, it's way too late to stop a stock market bubble uh, because the bubble had already formed. But that was particularly ironic because his comments last night about why the Fed should slow down its rate hikes. Because he was even, not too long ago, he was the guy, yeah, we're going to have four rate hikes this year. Right. That's what we're doing now. All of a sudden, he's saying maybe not. Maybe we should slow down. Maybe we should take a pause on these rate hikes. And the reason he's giving is the volatility in the stock market. Let me get this straight. (laughs) He says we should raise rates because we don't want a stock market bubble. They raise rates and the bubble is deflating. Right. Stock market is going down and he wants to stop the rate cuts because the market's going down. I mean, you know, you can't have it both ways. Right. Do you want do you, do you want to use monetary policy to prop up the stock market or not? Because he said we don't we, we want to raise rates because we don't want a stock market bubble. It turns out we already have a bubble, but now he wants to stop it from deflating. He wants to blow more air into it or keep the air from seeping out uh, by not raising rates further. So Bullard is now turned dove. And, you know, who's left? We got the FOMC minutes that came out Wednesday and in there. Only a couple of governors were not concerned about the weakness in the stock market. Just about everybody else was worried 
about what's going on in the stock market, and it is causing them to get nervous about, uh, I guess, the economy. But what really should get people nervous about the economy is the economy. I mean, the economy is really weak. That's one of the reasons that the stock market is going down. The other one being, of course, that the Fed pricked the bubble and the air is coming out. But we got today the leading economic indicators. And last month, those indicators were down. And in fact, the original estimate for December was down 02 and instead, we, we got now it's revised to down 0.3. But January is now down 0.2. And so that is the second consecutive month of declining leading economic indicators, back-to-back -back declines. Now, that has not happened since August and September of 2011. That's the last time we had back-to-back -back declines in the leading economic indicators. And here's the interesting part. QE2 ended in June of that year. So two months after the end of QE2, we started to get economic indicators flashing recession. And what did the Fed do? In September of 2011, the second month of the back-to-back -back declines in LEI, the Fed launched Operation Twist. So the Fed ends a stimulus program the economy starts to weaken and they come back to the rescue with another stimulus. Well, that's what's happening now. They just raised interest rates and now we're getting back-to-back -back declines in leading economic indicators. What's the Fed going to do, right? They're going to come back and save the market just the way they saved it in, in 2011 or save the economy. Now, we got more bad economic news today for the Philly Fed this is, I think, the sixth consecutive monthly decline. Now, February wasn't as bad as January. January was down 3.5%. February was down 2.8%. Still down. They were expecting down 2.5%. So even though they were expecting a decline, we got an even bigger decline than the one that they had been expecting. So that's more bad news that should be weighing on the markets. In fact, we got weak news on the housing market. Uh, housing starts dropping to, I think, a three-month low, much lower than what they were looking for. They were looking for starts at 1.175 million. Instead, we got 1.099 million. And permits were also light. They were looking for you know 1.224 million, and we got 1.202 million on on starts. And you know, I still think we got a ways to go in that level. I think we're just getting started when it comes to the the fallout in the housing market or the carnage. The one thing that's keeping it afloat is that we still have these ultra low mortgage rates. In fact, mortgage rates now are about the lowest they've been. I mean, this is the lowest they've been at any point in the cycle. So despite all that, right, the housing market is barely hanging on. And of course, very few people are buying houses. I mean, most people, despite these low rates, can't afford to buy. At best, you've got a big pickup in refinances between that and cheap gas. I mean, that's really what's keeping people alive. Although the cheap gas prices didn't do much to benefit Walmart, Walmart came out with their earnings earlier today. And though their earnings managed to beat the estimates, their revenue was below estimates, which is one of the reasons that Walmart stock was down on the day, although it closed off only 3%. At one point, it was down better than 5%. But I think the real problem for Walmart was its guidance. Walmart was predicting in 2016 that their sales would be up 3 to 4%. They're now predicting flat sales. That is a huge difference between predicting that your sales are going to grow 3 to 4% and now coming in and saying that your sales are going to be flat. And of course, Walmart is blaming the weakness on the strong dollar. Now, the strong dollar is certainly an excuse when it comes to their overseas earnings, right? If they have a store in Mexico and the peso is down. Yes, their earnings repatriated from Mexico are going to be down. But what Walmart is not talking about, and of course they have no incentive to talk about this, is the fact that the strong dollar is helping considerably their domestic earnings. How do I figure that? Well, first of all, gas prices are really cheap right now. We all know that. That's because of the strong dollar. 
Well, Walmart customers are certainly catching a break from cheap gas prices because that is leaving more money in their pockets, potentially to shop at Walmart. Now, some of that extra money they're spending on higher rent or higher health care. But imagine if they didn't have the benefit of the cheap gas. They might not ever be able to go to Walmart. So certainly Walmart is benefiting from the fact that their customers are not having to spend as much money on gasoline. And that is a byproduct of the strong dollar. But more particular to Walmart is their cost of goods sold. Almost everything, and by almost everything, I probably mean everything, that Walmart sells is imported. They don't sell anything that's made in America, except you know maybe produce or food, things like that. But the actual manufactured stuff, the products that people buy, they're all imported. And that means this strong dollar is keeping the cost of those imports down. So their labor costs are going up. They've got higher minimum wages. This is the one thing that's, that's keeping them afloat is the strong dollar. The strong dollar is allowing them to continue to have everyday low prices. Despite all the other problems, they've got the strong dollar that's propping up their whole business model. Because once the dollar starts to tank, and believe me, that's happening. Once that happens, you know, that's going to change everything for Walmart. You know, I've quoted as saying many times that when we finally have a dollar collapse, you know, going to Walmart is going to be like going to Neiman Marcus or Bordoroff Goodman's. But yeah, I mean, that's what it's going to look like. Or Saks Fifth Avenue. These prices are going to go up dramatically when the dollar goes down. So to hear Walmart try to blame its weak earnings on a strong dollar, Walmart is by far the largest beneficiary in the country of the strong dollar, right? They're the world's biggest importer. They're the world's biggest retailer. And so a strong dollar is key to their success. So when they're trying to blame their weak sales on a strong dollar, that is even more ridiculous than stores trying to blame their weak sales on the weather, right? This is, this is an even more ridiculous excuse. Now, I'm sure the weather was in there somewhere. I didn't, you know, I didn't see their entire... Uh, release or I wasn't listening to their call. I'm sure they blame the weather as well as the strong dollar. But the real problem is uh, not the weather or the dollar, but their customers. Their customers are broke. They have lousy jobs. They don't have jobs at all. And their cost of living is going up despite the fact that they got a break at the gas pump. And so they don't have the money to shop at Walmart. That is the real problem. Their, their customer base is hurting because this recovery is phony. I read this article in a lo local paper here today in Connecticut. And, you know, Connecticut has been raising taxes every couple of years. When I first moved to the state of Connecticut, the income tax was 4.9. And now it's 6.99. And every couple of years, they raise the income tax because of the budget, right? There's a budget deficit and they raise taxes. Well, they never cut spending, and so they never solve the problem. And so the debt keeps growing, and their solution is, well, to raise taxes again. Well, now apparently Malloy has decided that we're not going to raise taxes again. Maybe GE leaving the state and taking a lot of jobs and a lot of tax revenue with it, maybe uh, Malloy is saying, you know what, we can't kill the geese that we still have left. So maybe, just maybe, we should actually cut back on some of our government spending. And of course, that is a prompted outrage uh, from the unions. And the article I read today was now the teachers unions joining in demanding that instead of these draconian cuts, right, in government spending, that might mean that some government bureaucrats have to get actual jobs, that instead of doing that, we should just tax the rich because they're not paying their fair share. Right. And this is the mentality. This is, you know, the Bernie Sanders uh, mantra. Tax the rich. They're not paying their fair share. Now, first of all, what is fair share? Because, you know, they're talking about what percent of their incomes, of their total incomes, they pay in tax relative to poorer people where the property tax or the sales tax uh, take a higher percentage of their income. But if you look at actual tax paid, the one percent in Connecticut pays better than 40% of the income tax. So you're talking about 1% of the people paying better than 40% of the tax. To me, that sounds like they're overtaxed, right? If you want the rich to pay their fair share, you got to give them a tax cut because they're paying more than their fair share. It's probably the poorer people who aren't paying their fair share, but there's nothing fair 
about soaking the rich. Now, one of the interesting things about this article, too, is it has a quote. It says, instead of firing teachers or cutting government services, we should ask the most fortunate among us to pay their fair share. I mean, first of all, as I said, they're already paying way more than their fair share. That's why so many of them are leaving the state, because they're tired of uh, being mugged uh, by the mob that is the democracy of, uh, of Connecticut. But think about the words they use. They're calling the wealthy people fortunate, those fortunate few, the most fortunate. I mean, fortune implies luck, right? If you're fortunate, you're lucky, right? So people in Connecticut are lucky, right? If you're rich, it's not because of your hard work. You just got lucky. And since you got lucky, you should share your good fortune with other people in Connecticut who didn't have the luck that you did. They just didn't get as lucky as you, right? They want to minimize all of the work and all of the risks that went into accumulating that wealth. Now, yes, are there some hedge fund guys here in Greenwich who got lucky? Yeah, in a way. But in a way, of course, you make your own luck, right? They were smart enough to get into the hedge fund business in the first place, right? They read the, the writing on the wall and they got in on the action. But yes, they are lucky in some respects that, you know, we've had uh, Janet Yellen and Ben Bernanke and Alan Greenspan uh, with this type of monetary policy that they were able to, you know, ride that wave. But if it were that easy, everybody would be doing it. And of course, they're not. But the vast majority of wealthy people in Connecticut did not earn their money just surfing uh, the liquidity tide created by the central bank. There are plenty of entrepreneurs in this state and other states uh, that work damn hard building up businesses without the help of the government or the Fed. In fact, they had to overcome barriers imposed uh, by the government, and yet they managed to succeed. And they're entitled to everything that they earned, and other people shouldn't be taking it away from them under the guise uh, that they were lucky and they should share the winnings. But also in this article, it says that we should ask these fortunate few to to pay more taxes. I mean, the government never asks anybody to pay taxes, right? I never. The government doesn't give me a call and say, hey, Peter, uh, you know, we're just wondering, uh, would you mind paying a little bit extra taxes? I mean, you know, we just, just thought we'd ask. Because if the government asked me if I wanted to pay more taxes, you know what I'd tell them? <laughs> it's, you know, is this a trick question? Okay, no, thank, no, thank you. I'd rather not. Yeah, I considered your request and I decided I'd rather not pay higher taxes, right? See, the government doesn't ask me if I want to pay higher taxes. They tell me you're paying higher taxes or we're putting you in jail. I mean, the government takes money by force. Taxes are a forcible exaction. There's nothing polite uh, about it. Nobody is asked. You are told. The government takes. And you can complain all you want, but... If you if you try to protect it, if you try to avoid the tax, right, you can end up you can end up in jail. And I, you know, I know, obviously, from where I speak, because that's where my father lived out the last 10 years of his life uh, in jail. So it, it's not about asking. It's about demanding. It's about telling and taking. But of course, the left or these teachers unions, they want to make their crime sound less criminal, right? They want to they want to put all this language around it to make it sound better. Because really what it is is theft, right? That's all I mentioned again. The the Bernie Sanders, his whole campaign boils down to vote for me and I'll steal from you. Steal for you. That's what these teachers unions in Connecticut want. They want to steal uh, from other people so that they don't have to take a pay cut or that they don't have to give up something that they're getting for nothing or they don't have to go out and get a real job or whatever they're doing. Uh, and, you know, not not that teachers isn't a real job, but there's probably plenty of teachers in Connecticut that we don't need. There's a lot of bureaucrats and administrators that we don't need. There's a lot of vice principals we don't need. There's a whole bureaucracy, an educational bureaucracy that's been built up in this state that we don't need. And we wouldn't sacrifice any of the quality of the, the learning if the government cut back on uh, some of the excesses uh, in this bloated educational bureaucracy. But what they have to do is they have to couch the language in the most benign terms. So we're going to ask the fortunate to pay their fair share. Instead of saying, we're going to take more money uh, from people who are already overtaxed, right? That's the truth. We want to, we want to, take this group of people that is already overtaxed and we want to force them to turn over an even larger share 
of their income they're doing now. See, that doesn't sound as good. If you put it in those terms, we really want to stick it to the rich, right? Because we're jealous and we're envious and we don't think it's fair that they should have so much money and we don't. So let's just use the power of the state to rob more money and and divvy it up among uh, the unions because, you know, we've got the votes. That's really what they're saying, but they can't come out and say it like that. So they got to use the the, the type of language uh, that they're using. And, you know, as a result of that, a lot of people have asked me, Peter, when are you going to get out of Connecticut? Because I talk about all these high taxes. How come you're still there? I mean, I thought you, I thought you moved to Puerto Rico. And I haven't. What, what I've done is I've moved my asset management company to Puerto Rico. And so it's there. And several of my employees have left California because that's where my asset management company used to be based, in Newport Beach, California. It's now in Dorado Beach, Puerto Rico. We were in, uh, in San Juan for a while, but now we relocated the office to Dorado Beach, which is where I have a condo. And one of the other guys that helps me run the asset management company, he also lives in Dorado Beach. And so the office is probably, you know, five minute drive from where my condo in Puerto Rico is. But I haven't moved there myself yet because of family matters that are keeping me in the state of Connecticut. But believe me, my long term plan is to get out of this state. In the meantime, you know, money that used to be earned in California is now being earned in Puerto Rico. And so high tax California is not getting its mitts on that income anymore because now it's in Puerto Rico. And of course, a lot of that income used to flow through to me in Connecticut. Now it doesn't. That income is staying in Puerto Rico. I am not bringing it back to Connecticut where the teachers unions or any other unions can get their hands on it. And I have already done quite a bit as far as reducing the amount of money that I earn in the United States and in Connecticut and increase the money that I earn offshore, whether it's in Canada, whether it's at Euro Pacific Bank in the Caribbean or Euro Pacific Asset Management Company in Puerto Rico, that income is is not being earned in the United States. It's being earned by companies that are outside the United States and they're not paying any dividends to me. And so I'm not taking any of that income. And so the U.S. government and the state of Connecticut doesn't get to tax it. So even though I'm still here, if most of my income has left, then they get zero tax. And that is, you know, the laugher curve for you, right? If the tax rates were a lot lower, I wouldn't have a problem bringing the money home. But since they're not, since they're very high and likely headed higher, then I don't want the money. And this is the way people react uh, to laws or taxes like, you know, Bernie Sanders wants to have this transaction tax, this Wall Street transaction tax, and that's going to pay for free health care and free education. But it's not because all the transactions aren't going to take place the minute the government tries to tax them. They're going to take place offshore. People are going to react. They're going to change their behavior because of uh, government. It's like, look, if you're going to go through a neighborhood that you know maybe is a little bit seedy, right? Maybe you're gonna maybe you're gonna put your money in in your in your shoe or in your sock. If you think you might get mugged, you're you know maybe you're gonna you know hide your money so the, the muggers can't get it, right? I mean that's just a normal reaction. People don't want to get robbed. They don't want to get mugged. Well, the government mugs you too. Just because they they do it without a mask and they have the trappings of law doesn't change the nature of the transaction. Money is being taken from you by force, right, against your will, by people who didn't earn it, but who want it. And, and so people are going to change, change their behavior. As a result of that, you know, I put up a, uh, a video blog. If you want to check out the condominium I have in, in Puerto Rico, it's up there on my YouTube channel. It's in uh, Dorado Beach, Puerto Rico. It's at the Ritz-Carlton Reserve, which is a beautiful, beautiful property. I mean, if you've never uh, been to, uh, to you know, the Ritz-Carlton Reserve, I mean, it's a spectacular uh, beach in the Caribbean. So it's a really nice place to take a vacation. It's probably even a better place to live. And so if anybody is interested in, in checking out Puerto Rico, taking advantage of the breaks, I mean, everybody always hears about all the negatives about Puerto Rico uh, because they're broke, and they are. And they're broke because of government, right, because they've been feeling the burn uh, for decades down there. And now they're fried to a crisp. But, you know, they did come up with these two acts, Act 20 and 22. And if you move to Puerto Rico, you have uh, basically if you have a business, you have a 4 percent corporate tax and then you have a zero tax on dividends and capital gains. So if you start a business 
4% tax on your profits, pay yourself a dividend on those profits, zero tax, and then you make money, capital gains, pay nothing. It really is a tax paradise for Americans. And hopefully, uh, once they get out of these bigger problems, uh, this particular you know tax situation that they have, because it's really the only place in the world that Americans uh, get a break, where Americans are treated like everybody else. Because the U.S. government taxes your worldwide income, unlike any other country, except if that income is generated in Puerto Rico. That's the only exception. You go to Puerto Rico and you don't generate any, if you generate any income, the U.S. government's not going to tax you. Just Puerto Rican government's going to tax you. And up until recently, the Puerto Rican government taxed you a lot. Uh, but now they tax you a little, and a lot of people are there. In fact, they just had another conference last week. Uh, John Paulson was there with a Puerto Rican conference, and you know he's you know bought a lot of property in Puerto Rico and uh, continues to talk about the fact that he may relocate there himself. You know, interestingly enough, I put out a post. John Paulson, his hedge fund is the largest shareholder in the ETF GLD, and it turns out that he covered. A big part of his position, he sold out maybe a third of his gold holdings at the end of last year or sometime during the fourth quarter of last year. Apparently, he was nervous, too. He was worried about the Fed raising rates and how that might hurt gold, because that's what everybody thought. And of course, gold's gone the other way big time. So, you know, talk about a capitulation or somebody throwing in the towel. He didn't go flat gold. He didn't sell all of his gold, but he did get rid of a big portion of the gold that he had been holding on for years. And that's the type of capitulation that I like to see uh, at the end of, uh, of a correction or a bear market. And in fact, you know, I saw Jim Cramer again just yesterday, yesterday on CNBC, saying that he thought Goldman Sachs was wrong and that uh, you should buy gold because gold's going a lot higher. But then he said, don't buy it now. Wait for a pullback. He said this has been a parabolic move, and so wait for 1150 or 1100. And of course, now it's you know clo much closer to 1250. But just like Dennis Gartman, he says buy it, but wait for a pullback. But you know Dennis Gartman and the people who listen to Jim Cramer, they might be waiting a long time for this pullback. You know I think if you want to buy gold, you got to just buy it. If it pulls back, fine, you could buy a little more. But what if it doesn't pull back? What if you just watch it going up? You know, because I think the risk that the Kramers have or the Gartmans have is that they eventually chase the market. And sure, they buy it, but on a spike. And then they, they're on the wrong side of a pullback because now I guess they think gold's going up, but they're too fearful to buy it because they're afraid if they buy it, it'll pull back. What we need in this market is some greed, right? Right now, we've got mostly fear, and this bull market is climbing a wall of worry. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, I hope Gartman don't buy any gold because the longer they wait to buy it, the more expensive it's going to be when they, when they finally do. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They're all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is truth in media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news. 
where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthandmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into the Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthandmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth and Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed.